Hello, and welcome to our Tackling Illicit Finance videocast. I am Katie Jackson, and I lead our financial crime practice here in the UK. Economic crime creates an immense and unacceptable financial and human cost to society. Historically, public and private sectors have largely tackled the threat independently with some examples of success. However, lives continue to be devastated and less than 1% of the billions of pounds laundered annually is ever recovered. The time has now come for change. In these video casts, cross industry experts from across the world will explore the scale of this problem, the barriers to tackling it and the solutions that will improve the outcomes. And now let's hear from the speakers for this episode. Hello, my name is Peter McKay. I'm a former Justice Minister and Attorney General from Canada. I am pleased to be working as a Senior Advisor at Deloitte International. And welcome to the first edition of Tackling Illicit Finance, a series designed to discuss these important issues. And we are fortunate to have with us as our first guest, U.S. District Court Judge Mark Wolf, the Honorable Mark Wolf, who is from Massachusetts, and important for today's purpose, the chair of Integrity Initiatives International, a body that's aimed at tackling grand corruption and ultimately standing up an anti-corruption court to address the serious implications of corruption internationally. Thank you, Peter. It's very good to see you again. And Judge Wolf, we're going to be discussing a topic I know that is very near and dear to your heart. I dare say your life's work in many ways, which is how do we tackle corruption and, and what do we do? How can we bring about solutions for the future that will help us deal with this very corrosive problem that is so prevalent in so many countries? You've been seized with this issue from your earliest days, as I understand it, as a prosecutor, um, having worked inside government in the United States, and what led you to this point to believe that the founding of this important organization uh, is the, the path to follow? Well, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, and uh, my path to founding uh, with colleagues, including Justice Richard Goldstone from South Africa, the first prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal for the Yugoslavia and others, uh, of Integrity Initiatives International is very much rooted in my uh, professional history. Uh, as a young lawyer, after our Watergate scandal that led to the resignation of President Nixon, Richard Nixon, uh, basically because of corruption and malfeasance, uh, I was an assistant to the Attorney General of the United States and uh, was assisting him in grappling with the issues of how you ha hold even the highest elected officials accountable in a democracy. Uh, so five years later, I was the chief public corruption prosecutor in the District of Massachusetts, where a recent study had shown that corruption was a way of life. And after uh, my colleagues and I won more than 40 consecutive corruption cases, including many involving uh, the powerful mayor of the city of Boston, who resigned, uh, I was appointed United States District Judge uh, by the president, uh, one of about 700 people who hold that position in my country. At the same time uh, I've been a judge, I've been doing increasingly uh, international work, talking about the role of the judge in democracy, human rights issues, but particularly tackling corruption. And uh, two things became vividly clear to me. One, uh, uh, grand corruption, the abuse of public office for private gain by a nation's leaders flourished in many, many countries and had devastating consequences. And uh, two, uh, it didn't flourish because of a lack of laws. It flourished because these kleptocrats controlled the police, the prosecutors, and the courts in their own countries, and wouldn't permit the investigation, prosecution, and punishment of their families, their friends, and themselves. So it became uh, clear to me that uh, essentially two things needed to be done. 
One, there should be an organization whose mission would be to strengthen the enforcement of criminal laws against kleptocrats. And two, as part of that mission, there should be an international anti-corruption court uh, to prosecute and punish if they're convicted, these kleptocrats, uh, if uh, uh, they had impunity in their own countries. So Judge Wolf, you, you have uh, pursued this mission uh, for some time, and you, you've described a little bit for us the, the need, but perhaps if you would touch on the, the impact of corruption economically on society, and, and then I'd like to circle back and talk a little bit uh, about the court itself and, and how that yes. would operate. But, but the impact itself, uh, certainly from my understanding, in, in all of our countries, is, is enormously devastating to the public purse, but the impact that it has societally as well. Well, uh, it, it, Peter, I think you've I, identified it. Uh, and uh, to just amplify it, few things that you just said. First of all, uh, this is not just an issue in a far off part of the world. There are countries in Latin America, Africa, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, Asia, uh, that are devastated by grand corruption. But these are big issues in Canada, in the UK, and in the United States as well. And they're big issues for honest multinational corporations that want to do business uh, abroad uh, outside their home countries, uh, but can't because they won't uh, pay the bribes that are necessary to get that lucrative and fulfilling business. Uh, there, there are extreme economic consequences from uh, corruption generally and grand corruption particularly. Uh, although the statistics are not that reliable, it's been estimated by the World Bank that 5% of the uh, world's GDP is lost to corruption. Uh, more accurately, it's been uh, said that 10 times more is lost uh, to corruption in developing countries than they receive in foreign aid. So undermining all the international efforts to support these countries. Uh, but it's really the human consequences that in my view uh, uh, are the most severe. And frankly, what motivates uh, me uh, in this effort. Uh, the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights said uh, that corruption kills. The amount lost to corruption could uh, feed the world's hungry 80 times over. And it seems uh, that grand corruption, as you've described it, is, is on the rise. This is um, in part, perhaps attributable to the pandemic and more uh, illicit online activity. Another terrible uh, consequence of this increased activity is also the impact, and you referenced this earlier, on human rights, human trafficking, uh, forced labor. There are, are so many different consequences that flow from illicit finance, and our ability to coordinate the response uh, I, I would suggest it, it is at the root of how we address it in, in bringing more countries, more individuals, more institutions, and their efforts to bear on the subject of grand corruption. I, I think uh, that you really uh, used an essential term, uh, Peter, which is coordinate. And I, I would add to that, collaborate. Uh, grand corruption particularly is a transnational problem. Kleptocrats don't want to keep their uh, illicit funds in their own country, usually. Uh, and so they wander it through the international financial system and end up uh, buying property through straw buyers that, that, that disguise the real beneficial owners in London, in New York, in Palm Beach, in Paris, and uh, uh, many other very attractive places. Uh, and since it's a transnational problem, it's really crucial that there be a transnational approach uh, to combating it. And Your Honor, the, the, the challenge, of course, too, is the complexity of these cases. And uh, you, you have seen them, I'm sure, from different vantage points as a, as a prosecutor, as a public official, and from the bench. 
the, the challenge I know in, in our country, for example, in Canada, is, as you say, the, the illicit funds are moving across borders seamlessly. The sophistication that these kleptocrats um, employ to hide funds, to uh, solicit funds, to move money, uh, large amounts of money, and the, the complicity that, that other countries and governments may have to assist them in that regard is something that's also deeply troubling. Well, and, and not just, uh, yes to all of that, but not just other countries, because there are banks, there are real estate agents, there are uh, governments uh, that profit uh, from these illicit uh, funds. And this is why, again, there does need to be a sophisticated, uh, coordinated, collaborative uh, transnational effort. Well, before before we go to the the, the subject yeah. of the the uh, the court itself, which I know is a passion of yours, and I, I've uh, I've been very much convinced of this uh, almost from the first time we met, and and I have found myself uh, really enthralled by by uh, the way that this has unfolded and, and your pursuit, but. Tell me, I'm, I, I'm a former prosecutor like yourself. I, I worked as attorney general in Canada, but the, the continuity, that is the ability to present evidence to a court, whatever court that may be, um, it, is there issues there when we involve the private sector, when we involve a Deloitte, an audit, an outside assist when it comes to authorities, the police in particular, does that create an issue in your mind? The private organizations, companies uh, that do this forensic work, uh, as well as uh, public organizations like the International Anti-Corruption Coordination Center that's based in London and has representatives, FBI agents of the United States, Canada, uh, of Singapore, New Zealand, and associate status, Switzerland, and uh, Germany uh, are very valuable and, and they could collaborate and develop the evidence and keep a chain of uh, custody if it's necessary. But I think because these uh, financial transactions are designed uh, to be undetectable and therefore are complex, that uh, organizations, private and public, that have the sophistication uh, to unravel complex financial transactions is a crucial uh, step. One, it, it, one of the, the difficult things about crimes of corruption is if a bank's robbed, everybody knows a crime has been committed. Uh, and then the challenge is to find who robbed the bank. But if a bribe is paid to a high public official, neither party wants that known. Uh, so you really need uh, excellent work at what I call the front end to even sometimes discern whether a crime has been committed as the money disappeared. And the grand crime, as, as you've properly described it, it, it occurs to me that sometimes the larger the, the crime, the less likely there is to be accountability in today's world. And, and so I, I come back then to this need, in my view, this necessity for an international anti-corruption court and, and a, a, a gathering place for all nations. Uh, and I, I believe personally, there is a, a momentum and, and a feeling, a recognition that this, this is a, an idea whose time has come. Uh, speak to me a little bit about where we are on that journey and, and your own sense of, uh, of urgency to get this in place. Yeah, and, and if I could take a, a step back uh, because uh, you're quite familiar with the International Anti-Corruption Court and to the extent that there is now and there is momentum, you've contributed greatly uh, to providing it. But let me briefly describe the court. So, as I think I said earlier, grand corruption doesn't flourish because of a lack of laws. 187 countries are party to the United Nations Convention Against 
corruption. They all have laws as required that make money laundering and extortion and bribery, misappropriation of national resources illegal, but they don't enforce those laws against their corrupt leaders because their corrupt leaders control the administration of justice. So what is needed is an impartial forum that will prosecute corrupt officials for violating the laws of their own countries or an international treaty that's a counterpart of them. Uh, uh, when a country is unwilling or unable to prosecute itself. And in our shared conception, uh, this is a court that would be staffed by expert investigators, uh, expert corruption prosecutors, and experienced judges uh, from around the world. And it would uh, operate on a principle of complementarity. As I said, it would only prosecute if a country was unwilling or unable to prosecute itself. But this would be a forum uh, to hold uh, corrupt officials accountable, if they're proven guilty, to put them in prison, uh, which is the only effective deterrent and preventive measure. Uh, Whatever is being done now, efforts to recover assets, for example, is not sufficient. And if they're removed from office, it would create the opportunity for a democratic process to replace these corrupt leaders uh, with uh, leaders uh, who will serve their citizens rather than enrich themselves. In, in our conception, this court could also play a very valuable role in recovering, uh, repurposing, and repatriating stolen assets that uh, are vitally needed by the victimized countries. It could do that through orders of restitution or restoration in a criminal case. But in the United States, we have something called the False Claims Act, where private whistleblowers can bring cases based on confidential information, non-public information. And uh, that has recovered billions of dollars from the United States government and also rewarded those who bring meritorious cases. So that's the concept of the court. Uh, I wrote, it, I, I have been at this as longer than I wish to get to the point we're at, but it's very gratifying to be at the point uh, we're at, Peter. Uh, I know you've written extensively about this and uh, I commend those, those articles and interviews that you have done previously, which is what has made you really uh, the foremost expert in, in this regard on the concept. But if I could, uh, Judge Wolf, compare for us just the, the International Criminal Court, how this would flow or perhaps complement that effort, because it, it does occur to me that the, the concentrated effort here is on corruption as opposed to the, the, you know, the, the other type of terrible criminal acts that, uh, that bring a person to be before the International Criminal Court. But sadly, this appears to be a growth industry. And, and it appears to be at a moment in time when we really need to have both in order well, to, to respond adequately. Yes. Uh, and the International Anti-Corruption Court would be similar to, but separate from, the International Criminal Court, the ICC, uh, and they would complement the ICC because right. the most corrupt leaders are also the worst abusers of human rights. And it's while it's hard to make a money laundering case, uh, it's easier than making a genocide case because right. there is a paper trail. Uh, so they would certainly be complementary, uh, but both are needed. And uh, as my colleague Richard Goldstone very expertly uh, uh, says, uh, if you had corruption in the International Criminal Court, uh, it would inevitably get lower priority than crimes against humanity, war crimes, in inadequate attention. So something separate but complementary to the ICC uh, is, is a matter of principle and also pragmatically uh, the best approach. 
And you know, you've no. been very generous, very generous in in praising me. But uh, this concept is now becoming a coalition, and hopefully, very soon, a campaign. And that's because uh, this is no longer uh, the sort of quixotic, idiosyncratic idea of some judge in Massachusetts. This is uh, uh, an idea and a mission that's been embraced by many people with great uh, uh, capacity, really exemplified by you. So uh, uh, we're grateful uh, uh, for that, and I'm especially grateful for it. Just in the last couple of weeks, we've begun circulating a declaration in support of the International Anti-Corruption Court to just initially a small core of uh, particularly prominent international figures. And uh, it was very gratifying uh, to me that within the first two weeks, uh, two Nobel Peace Prize laureates uh, signed the declaration, six former prime ministers and presidents uh, signed the declaration, two former UN high commissioners of human rights. And while we were aiming to get you know, 20 or 25 significant signatories, uh, I'm holding a list of about 80. Uh, many from Canada, uh, including yourself, of course, uh, in a bipartisan effort in Canada, uh, also from the UK, uh, but from uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, where there's tremendous support for this, uh, from many Latin American countries uh, uh, and African and Eastern European countries as well. So it's um, quite encouraging and uh, hopefully we'll soon have this court where uh, with, if the Deloittes in the world are doing excellent forensic work, but fine or frustrated because uh, there's no place to present, present the evidence about the most powerful officials in the world, corrupt officials in the world, uh, there will be such an institution. Well, such an institution represents uh, a lot of hope and, uh, and credibility. And, and a restoration of people's belief and confidence in our justice system, but it's predicated on good people. And uh, I, I feel compelled to ask the question that if the opportunity ever arose for a, a judge as eminent as yourself to sit on such a court, would that, would that ever be of interest to you? Uh, well, I guess I'd say two things. Uh, I thought about this years ago. Uh, uh, because I was eligible to retire as a judge at 65 and get my salary for life. Now I'm 74 and essentially working as a judge for nothing. Uh, but when I was seriously contemplating this years ago, I thought I might prefer to prosecute the kleptocrats than judge them. Uh, because I, I believe deeply, you know, in the impartial administration of justice, but sometimes, uh, despicable people benefit from uh, the impartial administration of justice. A, if I were a younger man, I might prefer to be a prosecutor. Two, uh, I think uh, that this is uh, something that uh, uh, should be done by younger people. And actually one of the most hopeful things about the court is the tremendous support it has from younger people. So I think I would turn the question around would you like to be a prosecutor or a judge on this court? Because you fit the mold. You have eight-year-old children. I have eight-year-old grandchildren. Well, we are, uh, we are certainly kindred spirits when it comes to our, our belief in this pursuit. And uh, I'm not avoiding the question. I, I consider myself still uh, somebody who first and foremost um, values and reveres those in our justice system. Uh, the old adage that justice must not only be done, but seen to be done requires that we have quality people. Look, I, I like yourself, I, I would be honored to play a role in, uh, in a newly formed anti-corruption court. 
Um, my best memories in, in my career really go back to being in a courtroom and appearing before judges like yourself. And uh, I reveled in the, the opportunity to make um, cases on behalf of the public where you, you do represent the people, your community in, in a different way than, than when you're in elected office. So I very much embrace the idea that we, uh, we stand up this court, uh, that we uh, present this as a solution. And, and I guess <clears throat> to, to round out the discussion, it really is about addressing one of the great challenges of our time. Uh, and that is the, the theft of public money, the inappropriate expropriation of money for illicit purposes. And it, it's like a spider web that goes off in so many different directions. When, when the money is stolen, it is most often used for other types of, of illicit activities uh, and, and purchase of contraband and, and abuse of, uh, of individuals and human rights. And so we, we are at a moment in time and uh, I dare say that when we look back on this period and when we see the successful uh, standing up of this anti-corruption court, uh, in addition to all that you have done throughout your career, you will be a historic figure in this regard. And uh, I feel very honored to have uh, come to know you. Um, and although we are yet to meet in person, I, I consider you a friend and I look forward to continuing on this important journey to have an anti-corruption court operating in the world. And so this brings us to the end of uh, what I found to be a very substantive and, and fascinating discussion with the Honorable Mark Wolf, judge from Massachusetts, on the subject of grand corruption and the concept of a anti-corruption court. Most importantly, we talked about the impact that it has been having globally and the solutions for the future. I thank you all for tuning in and we look forward to continuing this series on tackling illicit finance and a series presented by Deloitte.